Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teals, Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about Christian faith. Do you know much about faith? Or about how important faith is? Jesus said that along with uh, mercy and judgment, faith was one of the weightier, more important matters of the law in Matthew 23. Uh, 23. And his disciples, they realized that faith was important. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 17 and read verse 5, or part of it. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, instead of actually telling them how to increase their faith, Jesus suggested they only had a little bit. But in other parts of the Bible, Jesus and others gave more details about how faith could be uh, increased. And we have a booklet on it, Faith for Those God Has Called and Chosen. And much of what I'm going to go over is in this particular booklet, which you can find online at www.ccog.org. That's www.ccog.org. Go under the literature tab, click on books and booklets, and our booklets will come up and you'll see this particular one. Now in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you don't have to go there, the Apostle Paul wrote, For we walk by faith, not by sight. In practical terms, this means that we live God's way of life even when we have trials and temptations, and when things seem almost hopeless, or when others try to deceive us. Now in Romans 3.31, and I'll just read this, Paul also wrote, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now I would like you to go to James, James chapter 2. James chapter 2, starting in verse 17. James wrote, Thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, it's dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, which is something people can't do in this context. And I will show you my faith by my works. And that was one of the things I remember from a long time ago. When I first started to uh, be called into the uh, Church of God, growing up uh, Roman Catholic, I remember hearing about commandments and stuff, and I wasn't going to do this, but we have a book on the Ten Commandments I should probably hold up. Uh, here it is. Uh, on the Ten Commandments. It also says the Decalogue, Christianity, and the Beast. So there's some prophetic ramifications. But I remember growing up uh, as Roman Catholic, I attended uh, Catholic school for a couple of years, but before then, before we went to Catholic school, uh, on Saturdays, at least for the kids in my neighborhood, uh, they had something called catechism, uh, which basically was teaching you Catholic doctrine. And I remember being taught the Ten Commandments, and a couple of them, they went and explained to us what they were. Uh, such as adultery, which they said was just for adults or something. So I had no idea what it was at that stage of my life. Anyway, they didn't give any explanation that I recall as to you know, why you would keep the Ten Commandments and uh, what their purpose was. But when I was being called in the Church of God, this became clear to me that, okay, God doesn't make a bunch of arbitrary rules. He doesn't have you to tell you to have faith just because he, he says so. He has you have faith to develop character in you and to help you become a better uh, person, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Well, anyway, I've digressed quite a bit from the booklet here and what I was going to talk about, but that's all right. Anyway, it says, You believe there's one God. You do well. But James says, well, even the demons believe, and they tremble. And you might say, oh, I really believe God. And, yeah, I've got all these flaws, but it's okay, because God understands. Oh, sure, he understands. He understands about the demons, too. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now, there's a lot of people these days who think that their works are totally fine, that they don't have to worry about anything that they're fine on their own, and they're keeping God's laws well enough, and this is okay. So yeah, they'll watch messages like this uh, from us or some other uh, Church of God type people. And every now and then give donations or something here or there. 
but they th they think it's sufficient. But they don't really have all the works to show that they have a living faith. Anyway, getting back to James, verse 21, he wrote, Was not Abraham our father? Was he justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and that by works faith was made perfect? So faith goes beyond just simply believing. I've mentioned before, it's funny, I'm talking I'm thinking about these booklets, and I'll hold this one up too. I was only planning on talking about a couple of booklets today. I might talk about this one later. We've got a booklet called Is God's Existence Logical? So let's talk about this for just a moment. Any real scientist who's interested in the truth, as opposed to blending in peer pressure or wanting to believe satanic lies, any real scientist will look at all the details must recognize that the idea that life just sprung up on its own is absolutely impossible. We've got a sermon at the Continuing COG channel we recently did on the subject, and you can watch that. Uh, holding up this booklet, and this one, like the other ones, any other ones I hold up are available at the ccg.org website. But it doesn't take faith to actually believe there's a God. Okay? Now, there is some faith involved, but you can logically conclude, if you look at all the facts, that there had to be something supernatural, as opposed to the physical world as we know, that created actually everything and made life begin. And, well, there's some, again some faith with that. Uh, the reality is, if you look at all this, at the science, the real science, not scientific hypotheses or false models like the evolutionary one, but if you actually look at the facts, you'll have to conclude that there is a God. And again, that's fine. Clyde, hopefully you'll do that. But again, the demons already know there's a God, so that of itself doesn't make you any more special to God. Of course, evils are precious and special to God, but the fact that you believe there's a God, so you should. Everybody should, whether or not they believe in the God of the Bible. They should at least conclude that there is a, a God if they're willing to look at the facts. And again, this booklet goes into the details, which I'm not going to go into today. Anyway, living faith includes action that God approves. We're supposed to live as Jesus did and, and as how Jesus wanted his followers to do. And we've got a booklet on that as well. Christians and Ambassadors of the Kingdom of God. It goes into some depth of how to live as a Christian. Okay. And But being a Christian is more than uh, avoiding uh, demonic holidays. Uh, we've got a booklet on that too. Should you keep God's holy days or demonic holidays? Keeping the Sabbath, uh, avoiding pagan holidays like Christmas, and uh, being honest in a dishonest society. We're also supposed to love those who don't love us, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 44 to 48. Now, Abraham's faith, it was shown by obedience in works in how he lived his life. Uh, not in a manifestation of miracles from his prayers. Abraham had living faith. It takes faith to live God's way in this world. Now, in James 2.22, he says that by works faith was made perfect. His faith was made perfect. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 48, that as far as Christians... Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, well, that's a tall order. But, of course, we're saved by faith, not by works. And let's go to Ephesians 2 to uh, go through that. In Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are all His. That's God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do nothing, to gaze at God forever, to strum a harp. No! For good works. Uh, as far as I'm talking about looking at God forever, uh, also known as a beatific vision, 
We gave a booklet on that too, The Mystery of God's Plan. Why did God create anything? Why did God make you? It goes into those type of things in more depth. And we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice the Bible says, although we're saved by grace, even that's a gift of God, and that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, starting verse 1, to give a biblical definition of faith. And I modified a word or two in this, and I'll explain that in a moment if you're following along with New King James. Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 1. Now faith is the foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were made from things which are... Excuse me. The things which were... I'll go again. The things which we, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So, in other words, it does take a certain amount of faith to recognize that there was a God who made all the things that we see. But as I said before, from a scientific perspective, uh, it is it is logical. And I don't know if I mentioned this before in a sermon, but I will now. I actually have held a sciences license, which is not required, by the way, but I've had one for a number of years by uh, one of the U.S. states. Anyway, verse 6. It says, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, a lot of people partially seek God. But they're not always diligent about it. And they come up with excuses, by the way, why they don't have to be more diligent. Oh, they think they're diligent. Some of them. Others realize that they're not. And the ones who realize they're not hopefully will repent and become diligent. But a lot of people kind of think they are, but it's like, oh, God doesn't expect me to overcome this problem, etc., etc. Even though Jesus said you're supposed to be perfect because your Father in heaven is perfect. They're like, well, well, you know, this is okay. And the other thing, of course, is a lot of people don't know about a lot of their flaws and faults. The, the uh, New Testament says, you know, how can you love God who you don't see if you can't love your brother who you do see? So there are people who've been hurt by various people or their feelings hurt or whatever it is. And they don't want to get together with lots of people because they don't like these people and they're afraid of these people or they're just figure that it's not good for their spiritual development, not realizing, not realizing that, uh, no, you're supposed to be able to get along with others, because that also helps show you and me flaws you and I have. I remember being single, and when you're single, you've got a certain attitude about yourself and what you're doing and whatever. Um, when you get married, particularly if you're married for some length of time, uh, you find out from your spouse that there's some areas that perhaps you didn't know you needed to build character in. And so a lot of times people who uh, completely break away from uh, the church, or, or a particular one, or in modern times a lot of people like to consider themselves independent, don't recognize many of the flaws and faults that they have. And now I realize that if you're part of, let's say, the continuing church of God, in uh, uh, North America, particularly, you may not be seeing other people every week, uh, and you, you can't if, if there's not any people by you. We certainly understand that. But you should at least make efforts to attend, for example, the Feast of Tabernacles uh, to get a chance to, to uh, interact with brethren, and there's other ways you can do it throughout the year. Now, I mentioned that I made a change to uh, Hebrews 11, uh, I modified it because both the King James and the New King James translate this word, the Greek word hypostasis as substance. But it literally means under stability. Because that's hypostasis means, hypo means under, stasis means uh, stability or foundation. So instead of me reading, faith is the substance of things hoped for. 
it's, I prefer foundation because I think it's a more accurate rendering of what the Greek says. There, and basically what it says is faith is the underlying stability that God's people are supposed to have. Having your faith built upon a rock as opposed to shifting sand. Those who have the love of the truth, really a love of the truth, not a love of some of the truth some of the time, but love of the truth, will have faith built on a foundation. It's a rock, and the rock is Christ. Now, I mentioned that it says in Hebrews 11, verse 6, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, do you really believe that God is rewarding those He's called and chosen who seek Him? And if so, how does this affect your life? Now, the Greek word most often translated as faith in the New Testament uh, be pronounced something like pistis. And I'm going to uh, read from BibleSoft's uh, definition of it. It says, pistis, persuasion, i.e. credence, moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher. Especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, abstractly, constancy in such profession, by extension, the system of religious gospel truth itself. Now, by system of truth, at least one minister felt included the concept of the work. And since Christians are supposed to be part of the work of God, it's fair, it's fair, it's fair to say that faith is part of the work. Now, in these end times, we've got people who don't really have as much faith in the Word of God as they should. We have a sermon message about this, but in the end times, most Christians are not Philadelphian Christians. Most Christians do not believe that God has been using, for example, dreams in the end times, even though it's prophesied to happen in the last days in Acts uh, uh, 2, verses uh, 17 and 18. And so it does take some faith to believe that God will do this. And sadly, most end-time Christians won't believe this. And it also does take a significant amount of faith at times to do the work. Particularly, now let's talk about people who are in scattered areas where we don't have a lot of people, which is uh, most of the continents. Uh, we've got most of our people in terms of large groups getting together in Africa and, uh, and, and a large one in uh, in Asia, but many times people are more separated and they're like, there's no way God would do it this way. Uh, this can't be. We had somebody who was with us for two or three years, partially with us. Never saw him at Feast of Tabernacles, though. And basically said, okay, I've given this a couple of years. God has not brought, raised a congregation in my area. Therefore, this is your other continuing church of God. Therefore, uh, I'm not going to stick around with this. But, you know, a lot of people are using their standards now. The Bible never says that. Use that as a standard. And you've heard me use the definition of Laodicea before. The term Laodicea means people decide, or judgment of the people. And this person decided that there's no group there. Of course, on the other hand, if this individual would have been more faithful, showed up to the Feast of Tabernacles, was a bit more diligent about the work, Perhaps this individual could have been a leader in that area. We could have referred people over to this individual and we may have ended up with a group. But no, he wanted to do it his way. Okay? He was like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay back till there's a big group I can just kind of blend in with. But that isn't really what God had in mind. We talk about the Philadelphians, Laodiceans and others, but regarding the Philadelphians, God causes calls them pillars. Oh, my wife and I visited places around the world and ancient sites, particularly in Europe. And Joyce will see these pillars and take pictures of them. And sometimes the only thing that's left is the foundation and pillars of these buildings because a lot of the roofs have collapsed. The pillars were willing and able to stand alone. And they'll support the structure. And you might say, well, God's not calling me to support anything well, then you're not a Philadelphian Christian because at minimum, at minimum, 
you should be supporting uh, the work of God as we work on the final phase of the work and we're working towards the, uh, the short work and preparing for that right now. Anyway, getting back to this again, faith is part of the work. And I've referred to Jude 3 frequently. I'm going to do it again. Christians are supposed to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And we have a booklet on that talks about some of that, called The Continuing History of the Church of God. We've got another one about Protestantism. I'm working on another one, a Catholic book, but just to using this particular one as an example. To the best of my knowledge, there is no other uh, Church of God group that's got anything to the depth and accuracy of this particular booklet. And this booklet helps explain, by the way, why the true church is not one of the normal Greco-Roman Protestant churches most people have heard of. And again, we have a book called Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism. And we've got one on the original, the belief of the original Catholic Church that's in process. That one's not available at all yet. But this particular one goes in more depth. It has got, let's see, how many references, not counting scripture. Uh, at least footnotes. It's got uh, over 300, not counting, not counting scriptures. And notice the Bible says you're supposed to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. This book helps pe let people understand what the original faith was. And I think in more depth than uh, other, what I've seen from uh, various other groups out there. And again, when it comes to Protestantism, I think our book on our Protestant book, uh, I'll copy that, yeah, I've got it here. I've got a version of it here anyway. Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism goes into more depth about how the Church of God differs from Protestantism than any other publication that I've ever I've ever seen. It's highly referenced, it's got all kinds of uh, references and historical references and scripture for those who really want to contend early for the faith once for all delivered the saints. And if you don't know what that faith is, how can you contend for it? And again, this other book, as I mentioned before, also helps you with that. Now, when Jude was writing to contend for the, earnestly for the faith, he was writing to Christians who have been called and chosen. And we're not just supposed to have faith, we're supposed to promote it. Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And that's what we in the Continuing Church of God are striving to do. Well, pretty much all of in the, who are truly in the churches of God, churches of Christ, believe they've been called and chosen. All should realize they're also supposed to be faithful. Yet, let, let me go to a Revelation 17, verse 14, which is actually where we get the title of this book. Revelation 17, verse 14. So when Jesus returns, notice who's with him. Revelation 17, verse 14. He, that's Jesus, is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Okay, and I realize that this is not an exact quote, but that's why those words are on here. We are called, who are called and chosen, uh, need to remain faithful. As far as being called, we also have a booklet on that, Is God Calling You? To go into more depth about that. And, we can talk, and you, if you've uh, not been called and baptized yet, this is something you should uh, read. And even if you have, it's still a book that I think would be helpful to read. Hey, we're not supposed to just obey God. We have to have faith that His ways are the best for us. Because if we don't really believe that God's ways are best, we just think there's a bunch of arbitrary rules and burdens, which is what a lot of Protestants have said about the Ten Commandments, Protestant leaders, uh, then we don't really have faith. We don't really have a working faith, a living faith. Because we really need to believe God's ways are best. I want to go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, uh, start at verse 18. Apostle Paul wrote, For I consider 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now I know a lot of people are suffering from various things. There are a lot of health issues, uh, economic issues, and other, and other issues. And with this COVID stuff all over, uh, it's made certain things worse in various parts of the world. But notice that the sufferings in this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is going to be revealed in us. And that's one of the reasons why I held up uh, our other booklet on uh, the mystery of God's plan. I was looking for it here. I've got a copy here someplace. I just held it up. I must have it. Well, anyway, the mystery of God's plan. Why did God make anything? Why did God uh, create, uh, make you? goes into why, what, the purpose of the plan. Now, I'm going to go into all the purpose of the plan today, but I will tell you that most people who claim to be Christian do not actually fully understand what God's plan is. And again, okay, here it is again, the mystery of God's plan. Why did God uh, create anything? Why did God make you? This goes into to lots of depth. If you don't understand what God's plan is, it's hard to have faith, real faith, that most people, including most Christians, do not fully understand uh, the extent of God's plan. Now, am I saying we need to continue in church of God know everything? No, I'm not saying that. But I do believe that the booklet I held up just a moment ago goes into it in more depth than any other one that I've seen uh, from, a, from a real Christian source. Well, anyway, going back to Romans chapter 8, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. You understand, whole creation is waiting for you to be deified if you're a true Christian. Why? Because you're going to make eternity better. God made what he did so eternity would be better. And God made you so through all the tests and trials that you go through in this life, you will develop character and have unique abilities in order to be able to give love in a unique way to make eternity better for yourself and every other one who will be in the family of God throughout eternity. Your purpose is fantastic and the entire creation groans waiting for this. I say, but a lot of things happen and I don't like it and I don't understand. Abraham didn't understand when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac. There's a lot of things people don't understand. But we're supposed to believe God. And if we have faith, we realize, it says in Romans 8, we might as well go down to verse 28 this time. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. Now, when things go wrong, we need to have the faith to endure to the end. It sometimes takes faith to realize that all things work together for our good. Uh, in my own case, I know I get frustrated. I work on certain things. As a matter of fact, today, for example, I was uh, uploading the uh, sermonette. Twice when I was uploading it, my computer just died. Don't know why. I had to restart so the third time it did it did work. I'm not sure why that happened. I wasn't planning on mentioning it in this particular uh, sermon, but it did. And I knew I was talking about faith today when I was uploading it, and thinking, okay, well, I'll have faith, and you know, if God doesn't want it to happen, or perhaps He wants me to delay it for some re doing the sermon for some reason, anyway. Or and now, now that I'm talking about it, maybe just one of the reasons was to give this as an example of things that uh, that happened. I'd like to go to Philippians chapter 1. I've uh, quoted the scripture uh, fairly often, but it's something, particularly when we go through our day-to-day -day lives, particularly when things don't go exactly the way we hope they would go, it should be comforting. The Apostle Paul wrote, Philippians 1, starting in verse 6, 
being very being confident at this very thing that he who began who be, who has begun excuse me a good work in you will complete it drop stuff in here until the day of Jesus Christ God's not going to give up on you if you don't give up on God and sometimes it's like you know can we keep up with this can we endure this can we put up with this uh, check you look down the line oh I won't be able to handle it I won't be able to handle it I won't be able to handle it Jesus said take things one day at a time if you and those who endure he also said those who endure the end will be saved and God is faithful okay if you stick with God God will stick with you now many people confuse feelings with faith while the faithful should have a godly confidence Faith is not really an emotion to be temporarily worked up, uh, which some people do. Not just the Pentecostal types, some others, various ones. But I want to go to James chapter 4. Starting verse 7. Submit, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When you're undergoing a test or trials you don't think you can handle, pray to God. Remember, Satan wants you to fall. God wants you to succeed. Submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify you, your hearts, you double-minded. Now, you're not supposed to be double-minded. Double-minded is, well, I kind of hope, kind of, maybe, maybe, believe, kind of, sort of believe the Bible. And yeah, kind of, quarter, of, maybe, maybe, maybe. And, you know, I kind of would like to follow God more, but, you know, I just don't know. It'd be too hard. I have problems with my family, I have problems with my job, I have problems with school. You can tell yourself all kinds of stuff. Um, how can I put this? I've had multiple jobs. My wife has as well. Uh, she lost at least one uh, because of church reasons, and, and, and so did I. But it worked out. We're both educated. I had problems with school. I've got at least a dozen years of college-slash-university education. So somehow it worked out. And I realized that things change. But it was not like, okay, I won't be able to get my bachelor's degree unless I take a test on the Sabbath, or I do this study on the Sabbath, or I can't get my PhD unless I don't keep the holy days, etc., etc., go away for the Feast of Tabernacles. We're not supposed to be double-minded. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, starting verse 5. Bible says, cutting into middle of verse 5, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. But what a lot of people do is they don't fully humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. They think, for example, I talked to somebody a long time ago. Uh, his attitude was, he'd been in the old worldwide church of God. And he had ministers who gave him counsel that he didn't like. And as it turned out, later, several of those ministers apostatized. Say they don't keep the Sabbath anymore, they were no longer, they're no longer Church of God Christians. And so he thinks because of that, he's wiser uh, than, than the ministry, I suppose, and that he's totally fine and he doesn't need to, he can be out totally on his own and, and whatever. He's not willing to humble himself. Many of us who've been around for decades have had various issues with various uh, real and false ministers, uh, including real ministers, by the way. But that's not an excuse to say, okay, there's not supposed to be a ministry. You don't have to pay attention to the ministry. The Bible, particularly the book of Ephesians and Corinthians, is clear that you are supposed to. But a lot of people won't do that because they have too much pride and they want to justify, for example, the fact that they've been independent for a long time. And 
When I say to people who've been independent for a long time, who contact us and are interested in coming back, and I've had this happen actually in the last uh, couple of weeks, a couple of different people, we don't say, oh, it was terrible you were gone all this length of time, you're horrible, anything like that. It's like, no. If you want to come back, if you, this is a good thing. You know the parable of the prodigal son. But it's also certain things people have to learn different ways. Some people had to learn some lessons by being apart from the Church of God for some period of time. Now, in my particular case, I never departed from the Church of God. When the apostasy hit the old Worldwide Church of God uh, to the point where it was untenable and clear it was no longer following the original faith, um, I wasn't really independent, but I attended with some others in the local area who had, uh, had just left. Uh, and they ended up leaning toward... Uh, uh, a particular Church of God group, and I attended with them for a while till the other Church of God group uh, I ended up with, which was uh, Global at the time, formed, and I was a host uh, there for a number of years, and then the Living Church. And so, in, our, in the case of my wife and I, we never left for any length of time. But we have, in the Canadian Church of God, people who've left for some period of time and realized it was time to come back. And it was also others who had difficulties with hierarchical government, governments who weren't handling it correctly. My last church, that was their problem. They preached hierarchical governments, but they didn't understand that the scriptures applied it to the ministry and not just the, the members. That was one of their problems. They had a problem with breaking promises, and they had problems with uh, Matthew 18 and some other, other issues. But anyway, that being said, be willing to humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And maybe if you've been out for a while or lukewarm for a while or double-minded for a while and you wanted to change now, this is, this, maybe this is your time. Anyway, you're supposed to cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. And he's not caring for you so you can just be on your own you know, you've heard the expression, no man is an island. And if you meditate about that, and I realize it's not scripture, but if you meditate on that in the context of the Bible, the context of the Bible, you'll realize, yes, no man or woman uh, is an island. And you know, when you read the New Testament about the hand can't say the foot, I don't need you, or the eye, it's, it's whatever, it said all the parts of the body are necessary. And you as an individual are not the whole body. You're a part. Now what particular part you have are, we may not know. We may not know until the age to come. But you can play a part in supporting the body uh, at this stage, even if you're not sure what your part is. Anyway, continuing, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the expression that I've heard in the past is that Satan hits his hardest where he thinks we're weakest. Anyway, verse 9, what are we supposed to do? Resist him steadfast in the faith. That foundation of truth. I'm going to hold, speaking of that, I'm going to hold up something else. I held up about God's existence logical because everybody needs to prove whether or not there's a God. And I think that's provable. The other thing everybody needs to prove is whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. Well, Jesus is the Messiah. This particular book, free online, ccog.org, you can find it, has hundreds of scriptures from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament. Now, of course, critics of the Bible say, well, New Testament writers, they just made that stuff up to, to line it up. No, it's more than that. Furthermore, Jesus made predictions that are re recorded in the New Testament that were fulfilled outside the New Testament. Only God can make predictions of the future and make them come to pass. Oh, I realize some people can make certain things. As far as talking about historical type of things, etc., God makes them come to pass. You can prove Jesus is the Messiah. Now, another concern that a lot of people have is whether or not the Bible is true. And we have a, a draft of book online, online called Who Gave the World the Bible? And you can prove that the Bible is true. 
from the God's Existence Logical Booklet, the Proof Jesus the Messiah uh, book, and this particular book on who gave the world the Bible. Because your foundation needs to be firm. Don't say, like many of the Greco-Roman Protestants, oh, I believe God and I'm just fine and this is okay. You need to really believe God. Have a firm foundation, not a foundation of sand. Anyway, going back to verse 9 of 1 Peter 5. Resist him, that's Satan, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now I know you're going to say, wait a second, I've got a particular problem with this particular part of my body or this particular relative, and it isn't the same as anybody else has in the whole world. Well, one, they may not have that precise they certainly wouldn't have that same relative, but they might have a similar problem. And they may not have a pain, let's say, in their small little toe that prevents them from walking. Maybe they have it in their elbow or, or whatever. And people have issues with their children and, and uh, their grandchildren and all these types of things. But notice that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You either believe that or you don't. Peter says, this is what's going on. There are thousands of people around the world who are part of the continuing church of God. And then there's tens of thousands of people uh, in other churches of God as well who are also our, our brothers and sisters. And they are experiencing various sufferings that we are. But notice verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory, notice his glory is eternal. Remember, as I mentioned before, your role, should you accept it, like they said, mission impossible, your mission, should you accept it, is to be able to, with your unique talents, give love to make eternity better for everyone, including yourself. And this is part of the eternal glory recalled by Christ Jesus. Now notice, after you have suffered a while, now you might think, look, I've suffered for decades. Okay, this is really, really bad. But, you know, I've suffered a while. Some people suffer certain things longer than others. Suffered for a while. Perfect, to perfect you, actually. Establish, strengthen, and settle you. Okay. And taking those biblical actions should increase faith. But it's not, real faith is not really that sense, the type of emotional session to temporarily make somebody feel that they have faith. In his uh, What is Faith booklet, the late uh, Church of God leaders, Pastor General of the old uh, radio and then Worldwide Church of God, uh, Herbert Armstrong wrote, Why People Lack Faith. So let me read some of what he wrote. And now, very briefly, why don't we have faith? And how may we get it? And how may it be increased? So many say, well, I have no impression. I have no feeling, no conviction that I should get the answer. Then they wait until they get a certain conviction, a certain feeling, the sort of assurance they can feel before they believe they have the answer. And since the apostasy of the old worldwide church of God, that's happened with lots of people. And since various things have happened in the various Laodicean churches, people wait a bit too long. I had somebody about a year ago say, well, I knew for sure it was time to leave the old Worldwide Church of God when they got rid of the Ten Commandments and this, 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 it didn't teach the gospel of the kingdom and blah, 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 blah. And I haven't seen anything, he was talking about the current church he's in, in that particular church that he thought was to that magnitude. And I said to him, look, no, that particular church is no intention to do away the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, the Holy Days, or whatever. But it did introduce, and I went through the doctrine, I won't mention it now because I don't want to identify that particular uh, church of God right now. I mentioned to him that this particular church had done something doctrinally, and uh, that was uh, that it was going to define itself by this particular doctrine, and that was the reason that I left them. And he thought, well, that's still not significant enough. Well, 
again, it wasn't that they quit becoming a church of God, but they were clearly no longer a representation of the Philadelphian portion of the church of God. But as Herbert Armstrong says, other people want to wait till they get a conviction, a certain feeling, an assurance they feel before they get the answer. And what I've suggested here is to read the Bible, read the literature that we put up, and for those who think all the churches of God are the same, watch the sermon that we have on Acts 2, 17, 18, or you can go to ccog.org and go into the questions and answers and see, read the one, does the continuing church of God have the signs of Acts 2, 17, 18? Look at that. Look at the scriptures. Believe God as opposed to, okay, I've got to build up this great feeling. And no, you can pray about it and fast about it and meditate about it. But anyway, Herbert Armstrong says, you've got to wait for a certain feeling. That's not faith. That's a feeling. He wrote, your faith, your convictions, your impressions, has absolutely not one thing or the other to do with faith. Faith only has to do with God's Word. And I keep holding up booklets that are full of scriptures from God's Word as well as some historical information. I'll hold this one up too, but it's a little too big to grab. But this one as well. That was the one that was too big to grab. I guess I'll hold up the one that was too large to grab. This particular one. Okay. Those books cite God's Word. The one question is, has God promised it in the Bible? Like, for example, the dreams. If he has, then probabilities, possibilities, feelings, convictions, impressions have nothing whatsoever to do with it. At least according to Herbert Armstrong. God has a thousand ways we know nothing of, of answering and providing whatever he has promised. We don't need to see how he's going to do it. People decided, okay, I'm only going to do this if I see this or, or that. You know, the Pharisees had the same problem and the Sadducees and some others in Jesus' day. And her song writes, and that's another thing. He, that's God, will almost never do it the way we expect. As I said, we lost somebody because uh, maybe a couple times we've lost people. We've couple, at least a couple times I think we've lost people who ex- said, uh, if this is the Philadelphia portion of the Church of God, God will raise up a congregation in our area for us to be able to attend. And when it didn't happen, when they wanted it, they said, okay, it can't be. But as Herbert Armstrong wrote, God will almost never do it the way we expect. So don't try to figure out how it's possible for God to do something. You're trusting in God. God is a supernatural power. So her our song writes, then believe in that power. God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. As I mentioned before, I mentioned about the mystery of God's plan. There's a lot of mysteries that even Christians do not understand. Now I'm not saying we understand all mysteries in the continuing church of God, but we do understand several of them in more depth than other groups I'm aware of. Anyway, Herb Armstrong writes, what he has promised he will perform, but he'll do it his way and in his time. But people say, oh no, I've got to do it in my time, the way I see it. No, it's done in God's time. Leave, it, leave all that to him and just trust him. Rely on his word. That's what Herb Armstrong wrote. Is that wrong? God's gift. And let us remember, faith is the gift of God. So many think that everything else that comes from God is His gift, but faith required to receive these things is something we ourselves must somehow work up or strain or strive for. But we just have to relax and trust God, even for the faith by which we receive everything else. Ephesians 2.8 Revelation 14.12 is a description of the true church. Those in the true church have the faith of Jesus. I want to change something here. Just write notes. Notice the faith of Jesus. It's not just the faith in Him, but His faith, the very faith which which He performed His miracles, placed in us, and is acting in us. How can you get it? Draw closer to God. 
Remember I quoted that not too long ago? Get to know God. Surrender all the ways to Him and do His will. And then pray. You get to know Him in prayer. We are too close to the material things. Remember I told you we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. The Apostle Paul wrote that. It's in the New Testament. It's not just something that Herbert Arbor, W. Armstrong or I made up. Through prayer, much more prayer, you can come closer to God and spiritual things. And we do, by the way, also have a booklet on prayer. What does the Bible teach? 28 tips on improving the effectiveness of your prayer. I wrote this book a long time ago, so I had to look at the subtitle. I didn't remember it all completely. I knew I had 28 tips in there, though. Okay, we're talking about prayer, you get to know Him. Through prayer, much more prayer, you can come closer to God and spiritual things. And what a happy, joyous experience it is once you've really done it. Anyway, concluding this section from Herbert Armstrong. Faith is a gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. But it's a gift that Christians can develop. Not through emotional appeals, but through living as Jesus lived and trusting God to see us through tests and trials. Feelings can be deceptive. Faith is true. You know, the Bible talks about faith coming from hearing by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And I've hold up various booklets, hoping or encouraging you to study them to help increase your faith. It's not that you're just a reader of the Word, but someone who actually does what it says. Now, I'm going to read James 2, verse 5. You don't have to go there. But James wrote, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised those who love him? Now the Bible in three places teach, teaches that the just live by faith. The first one is Habakkuk 2, verse 4. You don't have to go there. It says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. Now the contrast between the proud and the just indicates the faithful were not among the proud, but among the upright. The proud, the, pri, the proud have too much faith in themselves, as do the Laodiceans. Now, Paul wrote in Galatians 3, why don't you go there, we're going to start in verse 11. Galatians 3, verse 11 but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evidence. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now, what that last verse in Galatians teaches us is that while the law is not faith, the faithful will keep God's law. And I held up the booklet on the Ten Commandments before we still have it available, of course. Now let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans 1, uh, verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And yes, people should believe that God created everything. I, again, as a scientist, I think it's scientifically provable. Now, regarding the righteousness of God, you don't have to go there. In Psalm 119, verse 172, it states, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Yes, God's commandments are righteousness. Now, in Hebrews 11, why don't we go there starting in verse 13. Hebrews has some stuff to say about some of the just that were faithful. Hebrews 11, this time we'll pick it up in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. So the people went through lots of stuff, and they died without getting the promises. They uh, were not yet resurrected to eternal life, become part of God's family that way, etc., but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. 
we're not just looking to this earth. Okay. Yes, we need to eat, drink, sleep, etc., uh, work, whatever, and get along on this planet. But we're just strangers and pilgrims. We're passing through. One of the things that the Feast of Tabernacles points to is that this is only temporary. What we're looking for is much greater, the Millennial Kingdom of God. And I've got that. Yeah, hold on. There it is. This particular booklet we have available in over 100 languages at the ccog.org website. And while you can find the English version by going to the Literature tab, if you go to ccog.org and just keep going down, you'll see the listing of over 100 languages that we have this booklet in. Some of the translations are better than others, and if you're a great translator and you want to help us with some of the ones that you may be pulling in, that would be helpful. But most, some of the more common ones, we have people uh, who are skilled in them who are currently with us. Anyway, going back to Hebrews 11, this time picking up verse 14. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have an opportunity to return. So if you want to focus on where you were before you became a Christian, that's not the way to go. You've got to look at not longing for the ways of Satan, the ways of this world, but the ways of God and the reward that will come to those who diligently seek God. But now they desire a better, that is, a, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Could God be ashamed of you? Oh, I know everybody thinks they've got this really close, many people think they have this really close relationship with God. Is God ashamed of you? You think, oh no, you're just perfect. Well, no, better be careful about that. Uh, John wrote, if uh, we say we, uh, we're without sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he, that Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anyway, hopefully God's not ashamed of you being a Christian, called a Christian. And hopefully you're truly supporting the work and you're putting your life into living as a Christian. For he has prepared a city for them. That city is called New Jerusalem. Um, so the faithful while we live God's way of life on the earth we're focused on the hope of the future reward with God we're supposed to as Jesus said in Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of God but also on the earth we keep God's commandments Herbert Armstrong referred to uh, Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 and I'm going to read it Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Of course, it's not always easy to be part of the faithful. The expression, patience of the saints, indicates great difficulty at that time. But with the faith of Jesus, which God grants, we can endure. Sometimes we've got to endure things that seem unfair. And sometimes for a really long period of time. But don't succumb to bitterness. The Bible warns about that as well. The, God's people have wondered how long, since we can see, for example, look at Psalm 13, verse 1, and still continue to do so. And we'll still continue to do so, as you can see in Revelation 6.10. So if you're thinking how long, you're not unique that way. Okay? So apparently it's not wrong to say how long. But it is wrong to give up if you think it's too long. We have to continue even when it seems like there's no hope. I'm going to read Romans uh, 4, verse 18 from the New Living Translation. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. And ended up getting Isaac, by the way. Now I want to read uh, Galatians 2.20. And this time I'll read from a Catholic translation. Uh, this will be from the Dewey Rames Bible. Galatians 2.20 And I live, not now I, but Christ liveth in me. And that I live now in the flesh, I live in the, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me. 
We need to have the faith of Jesus and have Him live His life in us. If it weren't possible, the Bible wouldn't teach it. Have, to have faith. The Bible ties in faith with hope. I want to go to uh, Acts 24. You know, faith is a substance or the foundation of things that are hoped for. And hope is something we have to have. Acts 24, verse 15. I'm going to read this from the Old King James. And we have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious void of offense toward God and toward men. Not only is hope to be exercised, so essentially is faith. One exercises faith by living it. This isn't simply blind faith. The Bible teaches, and I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse, starting verse 21, and I'm also going to read this from the Old King James. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearances of, all appearance of evil. Well, I held up these booklets, uh, for example, Proof Jesus is the Messiah, and, uh, and yeah, here's one. Proof Jesus is the Messiah, and the other one I wanted, I held up before about uh, is God's existence logical? Because you can prove these things. You don't just have to accept them. A lot of people think, oh, you just believe, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, not, not, nothing, nothing is of importance. It's, it's all just fine. It's just as long as I have the right feeling. If I have the right feeling, it's fine. No, you need to prove there is a God. You need to prove Jesus is the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah. You need to prove the Word of God is reliable. Persecution is going to come. Those who have a foundation of sand will not endure. Prove all things. Hold fast which is good. I just quoted that from 1 Thessalonians. And in Romans 1.20, I'll go back to old, the New King James, the Bible teaches that one should be able to prove there's a God. It says, Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attribute are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Everybody should believe there is a God. And that can be proven. Of course, we've got to look beyond the physical. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. You may be getting older. Hint, tip, note, we're all getting older every day. But you might be elderly, and the older you get, the more obvious that some of your outward things are perishing. Some of us, or most of us, as we get older, our hair starts to change. Some of us get less of it. Our skin starts to, to wrinkle. Some of the joints don't quite work the way uh, they used to work, etc. Even though our outward man is perishing, and if you're, let's say, 21 and it's not obvious to you, it will be, and not too much longer. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. How do you renew the inward man day by day? Well, you're studying God's word. Uh, you're praying. You're living God's way of life. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, and I realize fully that many afflictions do not seem light. Okay? But our light affliction, which is for a moment, in terms of eternity, it's less than a moment is working for us for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You, people don't grasp the significance of how important the reward is going to be, how great and fantastic it's going to be. In, in the Old Testament, some people saw this. They went through tortures, they were killed, they suffered. Because they could see at least glimpses of it. Even in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says we can only see uh, dimly. 
And some things, as we've gotten closer, we can see a little bit better. But other things, we will not fully grasp until after we're resurrected. Uh, I've used this analogy, a similar analogy before, and that is, from where I sit at uh, my office, there are some shrubs. I was going to do this with paper, but we'll do the one I usually do with shrubs. And in these shrubs, there are leaves. There's thousands of these little leaves. They're about the size of my thumbnail here. There's thousands of them and that I can see. Matter of fact, maybe there's millions of them. Um, there's enough uh, things in our area, maybe, you know, I'm sure in total there's millions. But God knows more about the differences of any two of those leaves than everything you know. And unlike what you think you know, everything God knows is actually true. We hope that most of what we know is true. Okay? But everything that God knows is true. Again, he knows more about that. Um, let's hold this up. There's some water in this cup. You've seen me take sips of this water. I've been doing it throughout this uh, sermon. I'm pretty sure God knows more about the differences in every one of those sips that I've taken than you know in total. There's so much God knows to so much detail, to so much depth, that we just don't know. But we like to think we do. And sometimes we're too dismissive of aspects of His Word, or aspects of how He wants us to live, or aspects of how to deal with the church, or to support the work. Because we rely on our own understanding, our own feelings, uh, and sometimes use that as an excuse not to go forward and to be stuck in basically a Laodicean or worse attitude. So I got to the uh, end of verse 17. So now we go to verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, now we obviously look at things that are seen. I hold up this book that this is seen. But at the things which are not seen. What Paul is saying is, yeah, we see physical things, but that's not supposed to be our focus. He understood when Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Look, Paul gave up what he had. He said, but he was the great apostle Paul. Okay, well, he was Saul. He was an educated man, more educated than most. He could have had some position with the Sanhedrin or whatever. Some think he was had some kind of direct position anyway. I don't know if he did or not. That can be argued. and uh, But... He gave up a, what could be a successful career to what? To get beaten up a bunch of times? Jailed a few times? Shipwrecked? Okay? Because he was not focused on this world or what he was going to gain from this world. You know, when he was traveling, uh, sometimes he decided... To, best thing he needed to do was to actually physically work in his old occupation. Now, why would he do that? Because uh, he wrote, as a minister, he's entitled to get paid, but he didn't want to offend. He looked at the higher calling, and he was able to get by. Sometimes we think that we need the money that we should be uh, using for ties, either ties to the church or festival ties or, or whatever. We think that, oh, we can't keep the Sabbath correctly because of our job or whatever. Um, we're supposed to focus on things not seen, the coming kingdom of God. For the things which are seen are temporary, the Apostle Paul wrote. But things which are not seen are eternal. And people simply don't have enough focus on, on the eternal. And I want to hold that book up again. About the mystery of God's plan. Why did God uh, create anything? Why did God make you? Anyway, 
As far as faith goes, God's existence is a fact. I showed you our book on God's existence logical. It doesn't really take faith to believe there's a God, because even the demons believe that and tremble. But it does take faith to trust God, believe God, and to obey God. That's why I held up the book that we have about Christians being ambassadors for the kingdom of God. And that's part of the mystery, the mystery of faith. And again, uh, we do have a booklet on faith. I hold this up. That's available. And I want to do another sermon going more into faith. But until then, uh, again, you can go to ccog.org, uh, read the different booklets we have. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those who are Christian have to believe God and believe He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Endure to the end. Believe God. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.